Hello and welcome to Tipsy Tolstoy, Russian literature for the inebriated. I'm Matt Karasmovic, a PhD student in Russian lit. This week, um, I didn't have something planned for this week. I should have thought about this before we started recording, huh? <laughs> uh, well, we'll just keep the tape rolling and let everyone sit in silence while you think about it. Okay. I really didn't do a lot this week. <laughs> <laughs> Give us the names of each individual student you failed. Oh, thank you for saving me this week. <laughs> I began grading midterms, which I didn't like. It, though it is a, a certain fear that you can strike into people's hearts when you're talking about scheduling and you're like, oh, I can't do this week because I have midterms this week. And they're like, oh, yeah, midterms. I hate taking midterms. And I'm like, no, I'm not taking them. I'm grading them. It's far, far worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And I'm Cameron Lalana, and uh, we're, we're at an interesting part at my work where next week we're starting the programming that I oversee, so I have to do that. But I'm also like trying to double check all the work of the people I'm, I'm managing to make sure we really did reach out to everyone who's eligible for this program. Uh, so a lot of work is happening. However, I did spend the better part of about 30 minutes to maybe an hour today. I found a shortwave radio like thing that you can use online. So just playing around, trying to find little stations, and listening, and little conversations happening around the world. I was trying to find number stations. Uh, did not find any, but we'll keep working on that one. I think it's kind of a cop out if you don't like build your own. Build my own radio. Yes. All right, I'll take that challenge. I think you should. I'll let you know how that goes as I get into it. Please, I've got I've got enough. Um, I, well, not that much free time, but I've got enough energy uh, that I think I could put into it. I'm into it. This is a podcast for me and my good pal Cameron gets to unwind from our week with some Russian literature and a drink or two. This week, we're continuing on the months and months of Grossman, uh, not with Songrad at this point. We're going to go on to his short story, The Sistine Madonna, because we thought, hey, we just read Stalingrad. We deserve to do an episode on a short story once again, like the good old days. <laughs> remember? Remember when we used to do short story? Good times. Uh, I don't actually at this point anymore. Mm -hmm. I have a vague recollection of that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and as a slight correction, uh, if you listen to the end of our last episode, you know we announced that we're going to be talking to Robert Chandler, which we're they're still um, scheduling that. Unfortunately, we had to move some things around just because of our lives getting kind of weird. So we're working on getting that one rescheduled, and we'll bring it back to you uh, when we were able to. Still in the works, but for now, we're going to cover some other Grossman stuff. But before we get into talking about the Sistine Madonna art, life, what it means to be human, Matt, I've got to ask you, what are you drinking today? I got a real surprise out here for the old Tipsy Tolstoy folks. I am uh, okay. I am <laughs> drinking a Heineken 0.0. Mm. .0. That's right. I am non-alcoholic necrassoving it uh, tonight <laughs> on this podcast. I am on the sober grind right now <laughs> for a lot of reasons but <laughs> i love that you call it a grind <laughs> <laughs> grinding out those sober days um, every day i rise and grind as soon as i hit 6 a.m heineken null point null 12 p.m saint paul's beer also null point null <laughs> you know it's actually um i think a really efficient way to cut down or stop drinking is to have not just any non-alcoholic beer, but specifically the Heineken one, because it will make you think, wow, I really don't like beer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't get a buzz, so there's no reason to continue drinking it. The amount of beers I have left half drank now, unparalleled to any other point in my life. <laughs> Never have I left a beer unattended and half drank. <laughs> <laughs> until now until now i love heineken zero zeros well sorry <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay they're most i love them because they're situational when i was in college and trying to like be a dd but when you're at a party and everyone's drunk and it's just trying to peer pressure you just grab a bunch of those you can slam them all night and then also simultaneously uh stay to your dd duties while also really impressing everyone with how sober you are <laughs> i had we had a halloween party at our place not that long ago and i was I was kicking back some Heineken Zeros, and I don't think anybody realized I wasn't drinking. Yeah. So then you can really um, make fun of the ball when they all get a little tipsy, and you're like, I'm still going. No, really, what it made me think was, I was like, wow, these people aren't really that drunk. And I was like, 
how drunk have I been around these people before? <laughs> Which is perhaps a worse realization to have, but that's all right. That's that's fair. That's fair. Anyways, what what do you have tonight? Well, I'm uh, I'm going to support you on the the non-alcoholic Nekrasov oh. train because um, I am uh, my girlfriend and I are trying to get into running five Ks, and today's a running day. Uh, I know we we're so exciting, but we're on weekends. Obviously, we can always. Well, I mean, I can drink right now. You're on the sober grind, mm -hmm. uh, but tonight's a running night, so I have instead. Um, I'm I'm gonna give. I might accidentally like give myself enough give away enough information to let people John Lennon me if they want. <laughs> <laughs> but a local uh, kombucha brand, Amor Kombucha, uh, we've got one of their bottles. I actually have a special bottle of their Amor Kombucha because it's the Cascara flavor. Um, and there's a local coffee shop called Trail, which uh, gets all their coffee beans from one particular farm down in South America. I forget where. I want to say Colombia, but I'm not exactly certain. Uh, and it's got a certain, I guess, cherry flavor or cherry bark. Something. It's something specific about the Cascara trees or aggregates grown in. Uh, and then... This uh, kombucha brewery partnered with Trail Coffee to make this particular line of uh, Cascara cherry kombuchas, which are quite good. And I pick up sometimes instead of coffee in the morning. So That sounds good. Yeah, so the, you, know, you get some insight into my uh, morning routine, considering that there are only like three Trail coffees in the Central Valley and in the world. Start tracking them down, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I really am a proponent of cherry flavored things, and I know this makes me probably the minority. I think they're good, depending on the situation. Uh, I don't know. My girlfriend says that everything cherry flavored ends up tasting like cough syrup or uh, cold medicine. I disagree. That depends on your perspective on the flavor of cough, sy cough syrup. And I think that depends on if you bad. think <laughs> yeah, cough syrup tastes bad, <laughs> <laughs> which I also don't think it does. Yeah, well, that's a conversation for another, another episode when we are all up drinking cough syrup. Listen, let me clarify. I'm not just kicking back cough syrup, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it tastes bad. Welcome to Lean Lennon, where we get just high as balls and try to decipher <laughs> decipher talking about grain in 1916. going to be great. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the Sistine Madonna. Please, we're getting too far into the into the... As one YouTuber commented and called it, the useless banter from which I had to turn off the video. So, you better... You better cut it off. That last seven minutes of useless banter was just for you, mm -hmm. unknown commenter. That's right. Enjoy. Okay, so so we're not actually going to uh, go over what happens in the Sistine Madonna because it's only like six pages long and it's mostly... He sees the Sistine Madonna. He see... Well, no, there's two parts. He sees the Sistine Madonna. Then he thinks about the Sistine Madonna. <laughs> and then he thinks about it more. <laughs> and then he self-plagiarizes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually a lot. <laughs> Um, but so the Sistine Madonna is a work from the 16th century, early 16th century, uh, commissioned by Pope Julius II, uh, to the, uh, Italian painter Raphael, the Ninja Turtle? Uh, which was <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the, I the had most that famous Ninja week. Turtle. I had that one all week waiting. <laughs> You've been waiting for it. Yep. And so it was, it was created for a church in, in San Sisto, which is where it remained until later on. Uh, it was bought, brought to Dresden, and where, which is where it stayed until World War II, where uh, Red Army soldiers took it back to Russia until slightly after, actually, this piece was written when it was returned to, uh, to Germany. Or not Germany at the time, that Germany didn't exist, but you get what I mean. So that's, that's the system of not. So that's the context. I'll put a, a link to a picture of it if you want to see what Grossman was looking at in the show notes. I'll also be putting a link to the entire text of the system of Madonna. It's a really short read, and it's available online. If you are able, you can also find it in The Road, by, uh, which has been edited by Robert Chandler, uh, which has also a lot of other really great pieces by uh, Grossman. I've been reading it a lot, and I would highly recommend it. Yeah, I also picked it up, and it was really good. I need to add it to our website if you want to buy it through one of our affiliate links, because it actually is a really good collection. You get great stuff. I mean, you get early life stuff, stuff from the war, stuff from after the war. Um, and then some of the, the letters that he carried around written to his mother. Yeah. It's good. Got a lot of his most affecting work. Mm -hmm. Plus good, good notes. Just good notes. Good, great notes. Yeah. I, everything that the, the Chandlers, uh, either Robert Chandler or Robert and Elizabeth Chandler have done, which is a lot of Grossman stuff, you know, in addition to having the notes is just really like incomparable to reading without. Yeah. Even as someone who is theoretically an expert on, in this area, uh, many of the things are things that still go over my head or that I wouldn't have recognized necessarily as being that embedded of a reference. Yeah. 
Yeah. For what it's worth. But speaking of embedded references, let's talk about the text itself. This uh, story takes place in, at least when Green Grossman sees the Sistine Madonna, is 1955. So just place context. This is, of course, uh, three years after Stalin's death. Uh, this is when Grossman is in the middle of writing or trying to get um, Stalingrad released, going through a lot of those troubles we talked about over the course of the series. And I think it's in 54 that Grossman has started writing Life and Fate. And a lot of themes in Life and Fate, you can kind of see them. You can see the, 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 the inklings, the beginning of those thoughts in the Sistine Madonna. You know, although, of course, uh, Life and Fate would be written and rewritten over the course of the next six years as Grossman um, met more returnees from the uh, the various gulags Simult this is if i can describe it broadly a continuation of his ideas of beauty and humanity that you really see in stalingrad but it's also like i said the beginning of those feelings of dissatisfaction especially with the coming or recent soviet era uh, which will be really expanded on in life and fate mm -hmm. but the reason why we wanted to read this is uh well, first of all if i can put it on the on the plate matt is talking about ideas of beauty in please that's me gobbling up on my plate <laughs> <laughs> you talked about that a lot in in over the course of our series and i wanted yeah. to the reason why i suggested this is because i thought you would enjoy seeing this in a really condensed form um let's talk about beauty um i actually didn't like <laughs> the first part of it i didn't really get it to yeah. be honest um and like not like i didn't understand it but i uh, it took me a little while to understand why he wrote this and it's worth mentioning that it's divided into two parts two parts yeah uh in the first part that i didn't really understand it was essentially just him <laughs> just <laughs> giving kind of random assertions about art and about the painting um and it well i will just say it was a lot less literary than say stalingrad for instance in my opinion and then this implies then the second part that kind of you came around or no second part was second part was great second part pulled it together i was not expecting the second part yeah because i think I, the first part is a lot more of like him hypothesizing the place of the Sistine madonna in like humanity's present and the way it reflects humanity and the second part is more i guess more broader speculation on uh the Sistine madonna not just as like a symbol of humanity immortal but a symbol of troubled humanity of, of what is what is left at the end of the day when they live in times of darkness and fascism and, and in the time of wolves yeah and more specifically i feel like the imagery in the second part is where the general literariness of grossman really shines right what, what kind of the imagery stood out to you well particularly it's particularly um i thought it was a very rough read on the in the second part because mm. um it's talking about the way that mothers and children looked as they were essentially sent to gas chambers uh, by the Nazis. And he compares this to the Sistine Madonna and he's trying to look at what is the, what is shared? Why, why do they look like this? Like what is the kind of common thread of humanity that can't be trampled or killed? Uh, and I thought that was really powerful. And I thought this is why that image at the end of Stalingrad with the baby was so powerful. And I don't think it should be drawn as any sort of corollary that Grossman is saying, like, women's only place is to give birth by any means. Um, maybe he did think that. I don't know. I don't think that's what he's saying. But just the positive kind of symbol that it is, is powerful and hopeful in its own way. Right. And this is the same symbol we're seeing at the end of Stalingrad with uh, Vera being pregnant and um, Pavel, but not Pavel, uh, Stepan Spiridonov, mm -hmm. you know, saying, okay, we're going to protect the child. And not like an explicit, like, this is the future of, um, this is the future of uh, our, our nation, but in a very specific, like, he's seeing the strength and also childishness. Uh, Vera is a child. Um, no, she's like 19 or 20, but still quite young. Um, and, but seeing simultaneously that strength, that weakness of youth, but also like the a, a powerful feeling that needs to protect it, which I think is here. But instead of having without that character of like without, a, I guess, a father character, which in some ways I think, I mean, is you see a lot of characteristics from Grossman. And again, I like I hate to say that the, like his characters are him, but you see a lot of his own characteristics 
he puts into his characters and you see a lot of characteristics being used over and over again mm -hmm. and in this one i think he specifically points out like this is a specifically a mother and a son and a fatherless couple in particular at one point i forget where at some part in the second part he wonders um where is your father little one where did he perish in some bomb crater felling logs in the taiga in some dysentery barrack so you've got this mother and this and this child facing walking forward into what is what Grossman is mostly conceptualizing as pain and horror specifically with like a father figure who's dead and you know now a mother figure who walks in without fear who is holding her child forward not hiding him away pushing him to be to look dead into the eyes of the viewer into whatever horror that he's imagining it's a very specific formulation of this idea of you know motherhood as future which is like i think you do see in Stalingrad, but this is a different form of it. It's not as, it's hopeful, but not, I don't know how to say it, not happy. Maybe. I don't know. I, I think it's very complex in the way that he's saying mm. it. I was just going to point that I like that quote that you read because it was way different than the tone of Stalingrad, mm. which is largely kind of singing the praises of the men that are fighting. Mm. And for this to be written right after World War II, where the tons and tons of men were killed fighting for him to pick this sort of imagery and sort of portray it the way that he does, which is, you know, say, portrayed differently than Stalingrad. There's really no glory in death here in this specific passage. Dying in a bomb crater, felling logs in the taiga, presumably from, you know, being sentenced to a hard labor camp. Um, just the conditions of the war it's yeah it's it's different mm -hmm. but i think it's also it's interesting because it, so in one, a couple of paragraphs down he's kind of asking vanya vanya why are you looking so sad and is imagining who these who the people that both the mother and the child could be and he uh, and he imagines all the places he's, he's seen them and he remembers seeing quote unquote this the mother the sistine madonna at a train station in the 1930s breaking for bread he remembers seeing her son already 30 years old he was wearing worn-out soldier's boots um, in a padded jacket with a large hole exposing his milk-white shoulder. He was walking along a path through a bog. A huge cloud of midges was hanging above him, but he was unable to drive them away. He was unable to remove this living, flickering halo because he needed both of his hands to steady the damp, heavy log on his shoulder. At one moment, he raised his bowed head. I saw his fair, curly beard covering the whole of his face. I saw his half-open lips. I saw his eyes, and I knew them at once. They were the eyes that look out from Raphael's painting. So we got this uh, uh, interesting view where I'm, I'm trying to tangle to untangle what this means of you know obviously seeing this child who is in this case this is Jesus and this metaphor is drawn out where you see now a laborer a prisoner I, I would say likely um, who is being described in the in the way that in the way that Jesus went to his execution. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that meta what that context metaphor means in this context. You know, in the following part, the Madonna, in the immediate chapter is is a woman waiting for the Black Marias, the Cheka, the NKVD of whatever era, to come take away, uh, to come wait for her specifically, which is a theme we've seen in Akhmatova's poetry and in Requiem. Uh, the, the parallel between the Madonna and mothers waiting to be, in that case, mothers waiting for their sons to be taken away. In this case, the Madonna waiting for herself to be taken away. Uh, it's interesting, it's powerful, but I don't entirely know if I understand its presence. Uh, I think it's, for me, it really is just that you, you can't kill life, essentially. I mean, you can try and crucify people, you can, you know, execute groups of people, but it still goes on. There's some unbreakable unity, I think, that exists here that cannot really be broken. Yeah, that, that makes sense. That's why I don't think the images he chooses are particularly happy, but it's kind of like necessarily mm. optimistic because there's no mm -hmm. alternative, really. Right. In the sense that this is how life goes. Or this is essentially the story of life is there are lots of sacrifice and suffering i was gonna say i just think it's so interesting that he chooses the imagery that he chooses in general for this expression because he says that he's he sees the madonna as a purely uh atheistic expression of life and humanity without 
divine participation. But all of the imagery that he uses to describe it are divinely inspired down to like the diction that he chooses to use, which is so strange. Yeah, especially I think the way that I if, if I can just take us into the passage when she introduces it, um, it's thoroughly secular. But then, like you say, so much religious overtone exists in like the conclusions that follow. Yeah. Uh, he, he kind of talks about the he's in the beginning talking about the generations, um, which he says 12 generations, people, a fifth of the generation that have lived on Earth since the beginning of recorded history. And during the centuries, this painting has existed. European and colonial empires have risen and risen and fallen. The American nation has come into being. The factories of Pittsburgh and Detroit have gone into production. Revolutions have taken place and the world's social structure has changed. During these centuries, humanity has left behind it the superstitions of the alchemists. Just as it has abandoned hand-driven spinning wheels, muskets and halberds, sailing ships and horse-drawn mail coaches. Humanity has entered the age of electric generators, electric motors and turbines. It has entered the age of atomic reactors and hydrogen bombs. During these centuries, great scientists have shaped a new understanding of the universe. Galileo has written his dialogue, Newton his Principia, Einstein his On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies. During these centuries, Rembrandt, Goethe, Beethoven, Dostoevsky, and Tolstoy have enriched our souls and made our lives more beautiful. What I saw was a young mother holding a child in her arms. It's such a thoroughly secular uh, description, but then when he's drawing it out to say to see these characters in people he draws it out specifically in religious imagery which is like you say interesting <laughs> first of all i was gonna say isn't it weird to see in the whole story of all history that he lays out that the factories of pittsburgh and just detroit starting production <laughs> have a place in it i was like what <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's an interesting view it's an interesting he must have been reading about that at the time yeah. i feel like there's no other reason that you specifically bring that up as um as thinking about history <laughs> like i mean that that's cool they they did things they made things but i would say in the course in the grand course of history not the most important i think of a couple other things <laughs> there, were, there were a couple other things like, like no shade to pittsburgh and detroit but no, no, no. i mean in terms of world history i don't know if that 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 industrial era was the most important things to bring up no i don't think so but so i've been thinking about this a little bit because i've been taking a, a course or an independent study on Russian intellectual history. And this is not really important for the point I'm going to make. It's not that deep. Uh, but we've been talking about this with a lot of the different philosophical groups that are, that existed in Russia and still exist, et cetera, et cetera. And just generally the, this idea of progress, which I, I think starts to form kind of a an anti-Soviet sentiment actually in here. And I know we said like, yes, there are some things that are kind of like aesthetically anti-Soviet, you know, not glorifying the war and the people who died. It's in literature, it would be an aesthetically anti-Soviet thing to say something like that, right? But here, it's it's really on a philosophical level. I think he's starting to pose this issue, which is that, yes, history, you could say, progresses. Science has a clear progression. But do morals really progress? No, they can't if the Sistine Madonna still has this impact on people uh, and on well, the author himself, it's sort of this vessel. The art is sort of this vessel of morals in a way. I also think you about it because I'm taking a course on Tarkovsky and he is very much in line with this sort of thinking, which I think is actually extremely and profoundly anti-Soviet. Uh, I'm sure I'll write something about it in the future. Um, but you heard it here first. <laughs> No, that, that's a good point. I, it, throughout a lot of this piece, you do see things that I don't think you would have seen elsewhere. Uh, for example, so in the early part where he's trying to describe this secular beauty of the Sistine Madonna, um, well, at one point he's trying to describe the features of the mother and the son. And when he's describing the child um, and saying that it, you know, it's looking forward um, and also makes reference to uh, characters that he's written in several of the stories, he says of the child, um, 
Peasant children dying in years of famine had shown these qualities, uh, as did the children of Jewish craftsmen and shopkeepers during the Kishni of Pogrom, as have the children of Komite, Komite and so on and such forth. But um, peasant children dying in the years of famine uh, not, it's not a specific reference, but it could very easily have been read as a re- as as a reference to uh, the Holomador, uh, which is when the you know the pro- the products of um, forced collectivization in Ukraine you know drove millions to their deaths by starvation. Which uh, to a degree, uh, Grossman was uh, was d- did see he was in Ukraine during that time. Um, so i think that's something that other authors might have avoided who were talking about the black maria is coming for you know a woman as she waits in her apartment and she's the sympathetic one to your point about the aesthetic <laughs> rejection of not not just sorry, going beyond aesthetic rejection of not just taking on the usual talking points but into like profoundly profound discomfort with realities of the ussr at the time and i really oh, i would love to dig deeper but there's not enough in the text i don't think explore this what he means by saying that he thinks it's an atheistic expression of life i don't really know what he means by atheistic to be honest Mm -hmm. whether he denies like anything spiritual at all just the existence of a singular god what exactly he's saying because that's an interesting question because (laughs) i don't know if you can examine it secularly i mean okay if i can if i can try to take a stab at it sure. i think part of it is just that the second part of talking about the madonna and the way it reflects his own era because the first half really is talking about madonna as eternal beauty and something that's always relevant and the second half is making the madonna here is the madonna of our times and he says the madonna always looks the same this is the spirit of humanity regardless of the era um and that's why it's like the universal beauty i think mm-hmm. i think it's it's just kind of a necessary intellectual you know like basis for the rest of the idea where he he calls madonna's beauty uh tied to earthly life democratic human and humane it is a beauty that lives in every woman in the cross-eyed and hunchbacks with long pale noses in golden-skinned asians and black-skinned africans with curly hair and full lips it is a universal beauty this madonna is the soul and mirror of all human beings and everyone who looks at her can see her humanity she is the image of the maternal soul that is why her beauty is forever interwoven and fused with the beauty that lies hidden deep down, indestructible, wherever life is being born, be it in cellars, attics, pits, or palaces. So the, I think, I think just having this be a universal, like, sign of beauty, one that does not tie to the rise and fall of religions or specific areas, then makes it possible to say, well, then this is what uh, our, our immortal humanity means in our era because talking about the ideas of immortal humanity only makes sense if it's like really a true continuation and as he says at the beginning of the book he says i think i've always used immortal too loosely i need to have a more strict usage of it and given that he called one of his own books the people immortal uh Mm -hmm. uh definitely probably rethinking a lot of things there maybe that's what he's getting at just as a necessary and philosophical prelude to the rest but i i can't exactly say I mean, I, I feel like I kind of get what he's doing, but I, I just feel like his right, his discussion on, like, the immortal soul inherently brings in something spiritual to it. It's a very philosophical try- point to make for someone who, not that, like, Grossman isn't a deep thinker, but Grossman is a very, uh, is not a philosopher. Grossman understands philosophy, but it seems like Grossman is is a writer of humans and a writer of the law, like laws of science, which he seems to understand better than, I think, like philosophical bases perhaps i just i just can't get over the the passage when he's describing the madonna and he says they are one and they are separate they see feel and think together they are fused yet everything says that they will separate from each other that they cannot not separate that the essence of their communion of their fusion lies in their coming separation i just feel like he invokes a lot of christian imagery in this particular (laughs) passage and it's weird for someone who is not a christian i think and it's weird for some i don't really know if he was actually religious at all do you do you happen to know i there's i don't think there's anything to suggest that he was religious Mm -hmm. it but it definitely in his work and in his life he was deeply interested in at least the aesthetics and ideas of christianity and you know, as we've seen, use that use use that into his books a lot, and use this here quite quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I just feel like you don't. 
uh say things like the essence of their communion if you, if you don't have like <laughs> uh, like something else in mind and even like the way he he draws their sort of nature that they're one yet separate is very reminiscent of like the holy trinity right on just the basic level i you know i don't know where i'm going with that i'm just saying i think it's interesting i wrote not religious eh in my margins <laughs> I kind of, I don't know if this, I, I feel like this could relate to, he seems like he's really interested in the interplay between children and adults, because you see this in his work a lot. Sure. I think it's, I want to say it's in the short story, The Old Teacher, uh, in The Hell of Treblinka, you have characters where older people are basically like, especially in moments before their death, are kind of comforted and not to spoil, but there's also something that happens in life and fate, children who give adults a sense of peace and like the finally this like adult who maybe is missing something is like in this child who becomes their proxy child, even though I don't, and in, in none of the three cases, they're their actual like biological offspring. Uh, they make them comfortable in this moment of death and bring about that sense of humanity. You know, in the hell of Treblinka, he describes, um, you know, a woman going to the gas chamber and like finding a child and kind of just like protecting him until the last, even though he's not actually her, her son. And in this case, actually, the reason why I bring that case up specifically is because, like you said about the self plagiarization, there's a the beginning of part two of the Sisti Madonna is just a couple chapters from his work, The Hell of Treblinka. Um, and then that character in the Hell of Treblinka, who's like is originally a nameless woman, is he then reimagines her in this in this piece to be the Madonna and and babe. It's pretty. It's an interesting like reflection on his own work, though. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. I'm sure other authors probably do things like that too but i don't know it's a fun scavenger hunt it's your point about sorry coming back around to the philosophical anti-soviet nature of it um the quite often the the madonna the son and even the the absent father are portrayed as almost enemies of the state the like they you know it, were they being arrested by the secret police whether they're in you know labor camps already on the on its face the idea of calling the universal beauty and then aligning the universal beauty with these enemies of the state who are sure. uh, you know officially not acknowledged already one thing but he also goes further and imagines uh stalin having seen this and he he even imagines this and says with his soft slow stride wearing his low-heeled kid leather boots stalin went up to the painting and stroking his gray mustache and gazed for a long long time at the faces of mother and son did you recognize her had he met her during his own years of exile in eastern Siberia, in Novaya Uda, in Turkonsk, in Kresk, he had met her in transit prisons. He had met her when prisoners were being transferred from one place of exile to another. Did he think of her later, during the days of his grandeur? It's not directly, because he's like, when he has Stalin imagining the Madonna, it's, it's his own days of exile. But the very fact that this, he has, you know, Stalin looking at the Madonna, who's otherwise um, identified with the people that Stalin is you know sending to camps it's <laughs> the, the, it's not it's not super deep what he's thinking here yeah or not very deep down i should say no not in that instance it's not but it is maybe to wrap up unless we have a ton more yeah. just towards the end the culpability that he brings in where mm -hmm. he asked the question are you and i not to blame is good yeah it's good <laughs> It's good. I, I let me read that whole. Do you want to read that whole bit? Because that is that's just such a, a gut punch of a of a paragraph. Yeah, he says, and all this is frightening and shaming and painful. Why has life been so terrible? Are you and I not to blame? Why are we alive? A difficult and terrible question. Only the dead can ask it. Yet the dead are silent. They ask nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I leave us on a slightly more positive note? <laughs> no, because we didn't talk about how he describes our own era his own era i was gonna say what uh, let's let's uh, i was gonna let's read that and say in like the slightly you know in the, the eternal nature of humanity sure uh lasting on it gives us a slight bit of hope at the end please so imagining their own era he says what can we people of the epoch of fascism say before the court of the past in the future nothing can vindicate us we will say there has been no time crueler than ours Yet we did not allow what is human in man to perish. Seeing the Sisti Madonna go on her way, we preserve our faith that life and freedom are one, that there is nothing higher than what is human in man. 
This will live forever in triumph. So it is kind of happy. It is kind of happy. I will yes. note that that happens immediately on him fantasizing about the Madonna leading humanity forward as it's ended in thermonuclear warfare. So, <laughs> so less hat. Well, yeah. I mean, for the era, it makes sense. For the era immediately following, you know, the the victory of the time of wolf- wolfishness of the time of fascism, but immediately leading into the time of um, yeah. you know yeah. nuclear deterrence. It, um, I think, that mixture of looking forward and and congratu- and, and being happy about what is eternal and beautiful and also foreseeing the world ending in nuclear fire i don't know if it's that it's actually it's that contradictory yeah that well yeah it definitely has to do with the time he's writing but i also wonder if he's just trying to imagine like what could be worse than fascism yeah and i guess like the only thing you can really think of is like right the total annihilation of the world yeah i mean i we, uh, the only thing he could say to defend their era is that they didn't allow that idea of humanity to die. And I guess necessarily if humanity itself dies, then. <laughs> right, right. Well, I kind of feel like that's what. I don't know. I feel like that's got, that has to be kind of the takeaway for a lot of generations, too. Mm. Not just. But I mean, obviously, this is definitely more significant. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's it's interesting because he's not just right glorifying the result of the war it's just he's kind of saying like we did what is we achieved what is essentially the bare minimum which kind of already can't really be destroyed right yeah it's already immortal and eternal so somewhat somewhat there happiness wise (laughs) kind of yeah i mean it's not I mean, I feel like if he'd written this closer to 1960, this would have been a very different piece. But for the time being of it's still like Stalingrad, probably, I mean, it would be published, but, you know, on its way to being published and uh, life and fate still being very early on this piece for this time and place makes sense. I liked it overall. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, me too. I like, I like, it's like reading any chapter in Stalingrad where he just decides to philosophize for a bit, and it's always yeah, enjoyable yeah. to see his thoughts on things. Yeah, I still feel like I don't have it totally worked out, but nonetheless, I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I feel about a lot of Grossman's writing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I don't think the point <laughs> is to have it all worked out. Yeah, but I think uh, unless there's anything else you want to touch, touch upon, I think that's a good place to leave it. No, I'm good. It feels good to be back at the 40-minute mark where we started. It feels so short. <laughs> Oh, feels yeah, like I should have to talk other... for another hour. <laughs> we can just keep talking. Let's uh, let's have an hour of banter in the back end. <laughs> no, YouTube comments are gonna shred us. <laughs> okay, I know that was a bit of a shorter one, but uh, we needed a bit of a rest after the entirety of Stalingrad. Uh, so coming up next week, this is actually going to be a bit of a toss up. Uh, we're still working on scheduling that interview with robert not raymond chandler uh so that may be coming out next friday depending on when we can get that done uh but we might also be releasing another episode in its place we're thinking maybe the shot by pushkin which we originally planned to do almost an entire year ago now to finish out the year so (laughs) maybe we'll finally get to that maybe we'll go off in a completely different direction it remains to be seen before we let you go we wanted to extend a sincere thank you to all of our current patrons jacob elizabeth jay shannon blake amanda maya pack rob zachary austin isaac brett caitlin eli julie stephanie alex yitza joanne mysterious stoner dude elise allison brandon arini lou jesse Paige, jack daniel darren daniel janice Anne, madeline and jeff podcasting is not free and grad school does not pay very well so if you're interested in joining with our current patrons to keep the show running take a look at our patreon at patreon.com slash tipsy tolstoy the music used in this episode was soviet march by toasted tomatoes you can find more of their stuff on toastedtomatoes.bandcamp.com and on youtube under the same username if you're looking for more places to find us, you can follow us on Instagram at Tipsy Tolstoy Podcast, on Twitter at Tipsy Tolstoy, or you can join our email list on our website, tipsytolstoy.com. You'll hear from us again soon. Bye.